Well, really, Tales from Q School grew out of my experience researching A Good Walk Spoiled uh, back in the mid-90s because I went to the qualifying tournament finals that year, and I was struck by the intensity of it, the pressure, and the passion. And I always said I wanted to go back and do a really good, detailed look at all of qualifying school because I think most golf fans think that Q School is the finals. They hear stories about guys making the tour with a great finish or missing the tour with a collapse, and all of that happens and is a part of it, but there are actually three stages of Q School. There are more than 1,200 guys who enter in a given year going for those 30 spots plus ties on the tour. They have to go to 14 first stage sites around the country, then there are six second stage sites around the country, and then the 165 guys make it to the finals. So I wanted to really go back, start at the first stage, write about guys there, go through the second stage, write about what it's like to try to get to that point, and then the finals. And this was my chance to do that. Well, I think based on the odds, there have to be more sad stories. As I said, there are 1,200 guys starting out, and in 2005, 32 of them ended up completely satisfied by getting to the PGA Tour. And then there were some who were happy because they made the finals and got to at least play on the nationwide tour. But a majority of the guys don't even get through second stage, and they're thinking, where do I go next with my golf career? Do I go back to mini tours? Do I, can I make it through another year financially, or do I have to start thinking about getting a job? So more of the stories are probably on the sad side. A guy like Jackson Brigman, who in 1999 made it to the tour, shot 65 the last day of Q School, and then because his, one of his playing partners who was keeping his official card wrote down a four on a hole where he made a three, he, and, he, and he signed for that score, he ended up missing the tour by one shot and has never made it to the PGA Tour. So you do have stories like that. But then you've got uplifting stories. A guy like B.J. Staten, who had never made it past second stage, finished quadruple bogey bogey on the last day of second stage, thought he'd blown it. He, he couldn't even sign his scorecard. His hand was shaking so badly. And Brian Henninger, who I first encountered when I was doing a good walk spoiled in 1993 at Q School, and now he's back there again in 2005, who was playing with him, turned to the score and said, what's the number, the qualifying number? And the score said it's two under. Well, B.J. Staten, even with his collapse, had finished at two under. And when he realized he'd made it, that he hadn't blown it, he just burst into tears and started sobbing on Brian Henninger's shoulder because he was so relieved. And Brian Henniger was an emotional guy. He started crying. So there you have two golfers who barely know each other crying on each other's shoulders because one of them made it through second stage at Q School. I think most of them are smart enough to know that they're not the next Tiger and they're not the next Mickelson. I think most of them go with the attitude that since they became golfers, they're all elite golfers. Uh, they're all the number one guy on their high school team. They're all stars in college. They go with the attitude that the PGA Tour has been my dream. It's where I want to play. It's where you get to play in the major championships. It's where there's a lot of money to be made if you can make it that far. This is my dream, and the only way for me to live that dream is to get through Q School. It's a rite of passage. That's why the players refer to it as the fifth major. And most of the players of the last 42 years, Tom Watson and Ben Crenshaw and Tom Kite and Peter Jacobson and Davis Love and Jim Furyk and Fred Couples, I can go down the list forever, have gone through this rite of passage in order to play on the PGA Tour. <laughs> well, th you know, well there, there's a lot of it. I mean, I didn't know there, was ma there were as many good players uh, at the first stage who don't even make it through to the second stage. But th you see things. There was a moment at first stage uh, where there was a guy who accidentally, because a lot of these guys don't have caddies because they don't have any money yet, and they're, they're either carrying their own bag or dragging it around, uh, and a, a guy accidentally changed brands of golf ball during a, a round at first stage. He went from, I think, a Titleist to a Nike or something like that. That's against the rules because on the tour, where there are thousands of people watching, they don't want you doing that. They don't want you saying, hey, look, I played Nike this hole, I played Titleist, I played Callaway, and get paid to do it. But at Q School, there's nobody watching. There was The one guy who was watching when this incident took place was, was a guy who had been out fishing on the golf course who happened to be walking by, and the player, Chris Whistler, didn't even realize he changed brands of golf ball. When he did, he called in a rules official, and the rules official said, I hate to tell you this, but you're disqualified. He paid $5,000 just to be in Q school. So you see things like that, and it makes you shake your head, that's for sure.
And you know, the one again, one of the great things about golfers is that they understand the role of the media uh, because they're exposed to the media early and often, unlike tennis players who are frequently protected from the media and as a result don't develop a rapport. So when I started going to Q School, again, I was the only reporter there at first stage and basically the only reporter there at second stage. So I had the advantage that guys were like, oh, there's somebody here who's interested in hearing my story. And they were more than willing to talk. And having done four previous golf books, obviously I know a lot of the players. There were 42 guys at Q School in 2005 who had won at least once on the PGA Tour. And I think it's fair to say I knew every one of them. So that's obviously an advantage starting out when you already know a lot of the guys you're writing about. You never know where, where the next superstar is lurking. Uh, it's interesting to note that Arnold Palmer was 10 years older than Jack Nicklaus, and Jack Nicklaus was 10 years older than Tom Watson. And then we had this gap, and we got to Tiger and Phil together. So you never know where the next superstar can be. My guess is Tiger's great rival might be a 16-year-old who will be trying to make it to the tour through Q School in another five or six years. Who knows? Uh, the third one of my uh, uh, kids' mysteries is coming out late this summer. It's called Cover Up. Uh, it's set at the Super Bowl, and Stevie and Susan Carroll go to the Super Bowl, and they encounter a steroids cover-up. One of the team's entire offensive line has tested positive for human growth hormone, and the owner of the team is covering it up, and they have to try to figure it out. Well, uh, besides uh, cover-up coming out this summer, I'm working on a baseball book right now. It's a year in the life of two great aging pitchers, Tom Glavin and Mike Messina, and that'll be out at this time next year. Well, I'm fortunate in that I, I like bouncing from sport to sport, but I will say this about golf. I think it lends itself to great storytelling because it is so individual and because it's the most mental game we have. In, in what I mean by that, it, again, nobody is, is, tries to stop you from doing what you're doing. You don't get bad calls in golf. You don't get traded. You don't get benched. Either you succeed or you fail. And that's why I think there are so many funny stories, sad stories that happen in golf. One other example, Peter Jacobson years ago playing in Q School was playing with a guy who couldn't break 90. He had somehow gotten in under the radar and was in the event, and he was cheating. He was kicking his ball around in the rough, things like that. He finally went to a rules official said, what is this about? And the rules official said, let me check it out. The next day they show up on the first tee and they say to this guy, you've got to go home. And the guy goes, why? And they say, because last year you played under a different name in this event. And we wrote you a letter saying you can't come back. And you're playing under an assumed name. They'd done some research and found the guy had written down a different name, but the same address. He'd made that mistake. So they made him go home. And as he's leaving... He turns to Peter Jacobson and he says, you know, I believe I'm just going to go out to my rig and get my shotgun. And Peter Jacobson said, if you shoot a gun like you play golf, I'm not in any trouble.